technically your textbook gives you everything you need to know to work out these normal distribution area probability problems, but I felt like the textbook was a little vague, not covering a lot of details, so I have all these lectures, and I hope they're helping out, um, if not making you want to just fall asleep every day. Maybe I should do some software thing to make my voice sound really interesting, because it's not all that interesting, I'm sure. I don't find it so. Anyway, I hope you have all the pieces now to solve these kinds of problems, these problems where we where we use the normal approximation to estimate probabilities for real world situations. And now let's uh, work through some of those problems and hopefully whatever pieces we're missing, we can at least find out that they're missing, ask about them in class or work out what's missing. And changing the slides is a good idea. So the learning objectives here is to learn how to do this stuff. You just got to learn the whole thing, learn the whole process, beginning to end, which isn't a huge process, but it's unfamiliar at this point, and so it probably seems a little crazy. Let's remind ourselves of the basic engine of the problems. To solve the problems as we're going along, you might want to print this, uh, this screenshot or the slide from the PowerPoints or write this stuff down. You need especially those two formulas, those z-score formulas. First, we're going to use this one, but later on, once or twice, we might use this one as well. So you need to know this process. This is how we convert between raw scores and the normal table. And we use this process to solve several problems that we find in statistics. So here's an example. Geese fly in groups as they go south for the winter sometimes. And let's say the mean number of geese in a group is 8 with a standard deviation of 2.4. So I've just made a statement that's kind of vague, which means it's probably about a population. The mean number of geese, kind of all geese in the whole world, something. So let's assume that's a population. How often would we expect to see more than 12 geese flying south at once? Never mind about why we care about that question. That's harder to explain and come up with examples for. So we know that the distribution of the number of geese per group is approximately normal. Because of that, we can estimate the how often, that's a probability thing. We can estimate the probability of seeing more than 12 geese flying south at once. And we can do that by using the normal approximation. Now we don't know anything else about the data set of geese, about the distribution of geese. So we can't just go count the percentage that are more than 12 in a group. So we have to use the normal approximation in this case, if we can. So pause this if you wanna work through this problem on your own, and then I'll show, I'll show it worked through in a couple seconds. All right, moving on. Here's what we're going to do. The first thing we need to do, because we have a situation where we have a raw score, 12, and we need to find the area in the normal in the normal distribution where that raw score is a dividing point. And to do that, we have to convert it into a z-score because the tables don't tell you about you know, raw scores with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 2.4, or 8 and 2.4, whatever that was. They tell you a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So we need to turn this into a standard normal uh, value, which means turn it into a z-score. So we use this formula, and our raw score, our dividing point is 12, the mean is 8, and the standard deviation is 2.4. So the z-score of 12 geese per group is 1.67. And then in the table, in the textbook, we will find that the area below z of x is 0.9525, so 95.25%, but we usually express it especially while we're doing the math as just a probability proportion. So the row we're going to look for is the row of 1.6 in the normal probability table and the column of that says 0.07. Um, and because that tells us the area below, but we're interested in the area above because we're interested in the pr probability of, uh, of groups of geese having more than 12, not less than 12, right? So we want that above. So 0.9525, we have to use that complement, not rule. The probability of something is 0.95, and the probability of it not happening, the other thing, is 1 minus 0.95. So the probability of not having less than 12. Anyway, one point. That will give us the top end. 4.75% of the time. So here's a close-up of what we looked at in the table. This is your table kind of put onto one uh, screen. So we looked up row for 1.6, the column for 0.07. The way this is organized, you have to find out whether it's a positive z-score or a negative z-score first. And your z-score is positive, 1.67. So you find 1.6, but you need to know 1.67. The 1.6, these are the probabilities. So you need to find exactly which one it is, and in this row, 1.7. So I actually have the zooming action going here so you can see it closer in your screen. So the probability we found in our table was 0.9525. 
and that gave us the area below and so we had to take one minus our probability to find the area above that point in the normal distribution and that was our estimate from the normal distribution estimated proportion percentage probability so let's remind ourselves of what some of the stuff is here this is the raw score the number of geese per group also eight is a kind of raw score it's in the scale of raw scores 2.4 is in the scale of the raw scores the mean and the standard deviation are always in the same scale as the raw scores but this is an actual raw score because we're saying what this is this is the dividing point we're interested in this the number we're going to plug into that distribution and divide it into two pieces these are z-scores that's the intermediate step and then these are the probabilities proportions areas under the core curve that kind of thing so those are the three kinds of things that are involved they're very different kinds of things it's important to keep them straight actually this would be point 0475 if you wanted to be all probability about it here's a graph of how this looks we found the area the table gives you this the table shows you that the area below a z-score of 1.67 1.67 here raw scores is 12 although the scale here is really weird i haven't figured out how to make my function just do whole numbers when i should uh when it should be whole numbers anyway it works i've got the raw score scale here the z-score scale down here z and either way you look at it you translated from raw scores into z-scores, you found out that the area below that point under the normal distribution is 0.95 something. Actually, it's a little different from the table because the computer is more precise than the table is going to be. The table has to limit itself to the number of numbers that it can put on one page. That level of precision doesn't matter. Um, it's close enough. Plus, we're estimating anyway, right? We're assuming that the distribution of number of geese flying south is perfectly normal going from, you know, down here up to here. It's probably not perfectly normal, so we're off to some extent anyway. So I'm not going to care about whether it's 0.9545 or 0.95221. Anyway, you get about this, and you take one minus that, because what we're really looking for is the area of this tail. And that's our estimate of the proportion of geese who will do that. That's the value from the table, and this is what we wanted to know. So here's another example. See if you can figure it out by yourself before unpausing the video. If the average American has an IQ of 100, standard deviation of 15 with an approximately normal distribution. Now that's this key. If I say approximately normal in a problem in this class, um, just go ahead and say it's normal. I'm using this whole process with the normal table and everything. Later we'll talk about how to determine how normal is normal, but at least for problems where we're just practicing z-scores and using the table. If I say approximately normal, that means go use the table, use these z-scores, do this process. So what's the probability the randomly selected adult would have an IQ of 65 or lower? Let me tell you that is a low IQ, and you're going to see why in a minute here. So I said it's normal, so we can use the normal approximation. So let's work this out. We're going to do this business. We have 65. That's our cutoff point. The raw score distribution is the distribution of IQ scores. And one of those IQ scores, hypothetically, is 65, but that's okay. It fits with everything else. So we need to find out its z-score before we can figure out the area below it in a normal distribution. So to figure this out, we need this formula. And applying the formula, x minus mu over sigma, 65 minus 100 over, over 15, that's negative 2.33. Looking in the table here, we find out that the area below it is about 0.01, about 1%, 0 0.0099. So I'm going to round that up to 1%. And here it is in the table, 0 0.00, wait. I got the wrong table value. I got 0 0.0059 here. I think I put my scores in the wrong places. Yeah, I'm going to just skip past this. So the area here um, is 0 0.00. And the computer says it's 0.98, whereas the table in the back of your book said 0 0.99. But that's a very small percentage. 65 here, a z-score of negative 2.3 here. Same thing. Below them, in a normal distribution, we have only... 1%, slightly less than 1% of the, of, the, of the area of the distribution. Therefore, less than 1% of the population, we would estimate, has IQs that low. Therefore, the probability of randomly selecting somebody is that same thing. It's 0 0.0098. It's 1% more or less. So here's what we got from the table, and it's also exactly what we wanted to know. So here's another one. Pause as necessary so you can work this out yourself. What's the best estimate of the percentage of Americans who would score between 30 and 70 on a civics test? Say so you take a random sample of citizens. 
This one's going to be harder because it's between two values, not above one value and below one value, etc. Actually, it is above one and below one, but it's a little, a little tricky to work out. But when you see how you do it, that part of it's not terribly complicated as soon as you see the trick. It's approximately a normal distribution, how everybody does on those tests, the test scores, a mean of 27 and a standard deviation of 15. And I said the distribution is approximately normal, so we can estimate using the normal approximation. So pause here if you don't want to see answers. We need to figure out the z of x so that we can use that to look up probabilities in the normal distribution table. And the z of x turns out to be 0.2. There we go. We look up 0.2 in the table, and we have 0.5793 below that. Now, let's look up a second one. Let's look up the z-score for 70, because 30 is the lower area, the lower dividing line of the area that we're interested in, and 70 is the upper dividing line. Your table doesn't tell you area between things or area outside things. Everything is to the left. It just tells you probability to the left of this, to the left of this thing here. So we find 0.99, or point, almost 1.0, 0 0.997 to the left of a z-score of um, 2.87, because it's pretty far over there to the right. Almost everything is below it. So how do we combine those two things? We just subtract. As long as it was left of this and left of this, you just take the bigger one minus the smaller one, whichever one then that is. And so the area is 0.42 essentially. 41.8% of Americans could get between those two scores. I don't know why we would want to know that, but maybe somebody would. Graphically, it looks kind of like this. This is the first z-score and this is the second z-score. So the mean is right there. For the z-score, or sorry, the raw scores are there, x of 30 and x of 70. You can see that the z-score for an x of 30 is right down here. The z-score for an x of 70 is right here, 2.8 or whatever that was. And the area below this x is uh, about 58% of the distribution, 0.58. Below this one is about 0 0.99, 0 0.0, almost 10. And so you just subtract. And so the area in here is your answer. Subtract this one from this one, the small one from the larger one. All right, so here's another one. What's the probability of randomly selecting a community mental health client with a BDI, Beck Depression Inventory? It's a short little test we give to people just to kind of get a, a rough guess, rough idea of how you're feeling lately. It's not a good diagnostic tool, but it's a screen. It, if you answer, if you get a really low, really high score on it, it means that you're experiencing some symptoms that might be depression. And so somebody's probably going to talk to you about that and ask some more detailed questions. So what's the probability of randomly selecting a community mental health client with a BDI score of five or greater? And this might, this is an interesting thing to know because uh, if it's a very small percentage, then you know that your red flag should go up really high if you see a score of five or greater, right? The distribution of these scores is approximately normal, at least in one study with a mean of 8.74 and a standard deviation of 9.7. And since it's approximately normal, we can estimate the probability of getting a score of five or greater using the normal approximation. So here we go. The z-score for five, since it's below the mean, is negative 0.39. Now, one thing it that that tells us immediately is that the probability is gonna be greater than 0.5, right? If the z-score is to the left of the middle, but you want the probability to the right of that, well, then you have the everything to the right of the middle is going to be part of your probability. So it's going to be a fairly large probability. We look up in the table, and we found that the area beyond z to the left of z is 0.35, more or less. But we're not interested in the left of z. We're interested in the stuff to the right of z. So the area to the right of z is 1 minus what we found, 0.3483. So it's about 65%, so 0.65 probability. So about two-thirds of people, you have about a two-thirds probability that somebody's going to get a score above that. Here's the diagram that shows this. Your table value that you look up is 0.35. What you wanted to know is actually about 0.65. So you have to take one minus what you found in the table since you're looking for the stuff on the other side of the of the, your dividing line, not the side that the table gave you. And the people who make these tables assume that you're smart enough to figure that out. And sometimes they make these tables horribly complicated because they're just trying to pack as much information as they can on one page. Anyway, x equals 5 was the dividing line. I put some of those animations at the wrong time. So here's an important detail. Z-scores work for any distribution, but the normal approximation is only used with approximately normal data. You can't figure out areas under the curve for, for distributions that are not normal. Um, 
Uh, there's a whole family of distributions that you can do this with, but the very specific distributions and the normal curve is the most common one. Just your basic random distribution, you can't figure out areas using z-scores. It's just not, it just doesn't exist. It's just not possible to do that. You have to actually get the data and count. So the normal distribution is special because it's one of the kinds of distributions where you can use that trick. So even though you can use z-scores with anything, you can't necessarily figure out areas by using z-scores. So if you're using the, appro the normal approximation, then you need to understand how normal the data really is going to be. And we'll talk about that more in a later, in a later, um, uh, sorry, in a later lecture here. But you, but just for right now, I can say you can look for clues in the data or cues or clues, clues. Which one did I mean? They both work. So is the histogram symmetrical, and is it taller in the middle? And even better, does it have kind of a bell shape with little tails? Now, if it's a homework problem, I'll be giving you cues to let you know that this is what you should be doing. I'll be saying approximately normal, normally distributed, nearly normal. And those are little cues that mean if, if you're supposed to figure out probabilities, go ahead and use the normal approximation to do that. So what if the distribution is really non-normal? As I've mentioned before, don't use the normal curve approximation. Don't use any of the stuff we've been doing here. But as I've mentioned before, later we'll see, not right now, not this week, that the central limit theorem can help and it can uh, make some of that not matter as much. And although you don't need to know this, there's actually a whole lot of more advanced statistical methods where you, they're actually really funky. And if anybody's interested, I'll explain them to you. They're a lot of fun. Uh, bootstraps, jackknives, they have really neat names developed in the last uh, few decades and they can help you make sense of data that's not totally normal but we're not going to cover those in this class either even though some software like r is pretty good at making it kind of a simple process but it's beyond what we should learn in this particular class so um i guess we're all finished with this lecture right now and we're going to keep talking about this because believe it or not we are not finished